Amen. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Melissa. I tell you, it's just wonderful to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? It's wonderful to gather together under the umbrella of the Word of God. I don't know if you noticed, but there's some of these lying around in your pews. Um, I have already been warned by several that I must be pretty confident today because I have armed the congregation. Um, children, please don't throw the rocks. But uh, all of you who can have one close, go ahead and grab it. I want you to hold this one in your hand today as we talk, okay? One morning, a farmer and his wife were sitting down to breakfast, and as was their custom, the wife set the husband's plate in front of him for breakfast, and as again, as she started almost every morning, she said, dear, how are you doing today? He looked back up at her and said, well, kind of feel like a window today. Now, this was different. This was unusual, so his wife looks at him quite confused and says, well, dear, what, what does that mean? He said, full of pains, full of pains. <laughs> you ever had one of those kind of mornings? One of those kind of weeks or months or years even? I, I got to tell you, honestly, this is a pain-filled world that we live in, isn't it? And I'm not talking about window pains. Sometimes we feel that way. Life is hard. Life can be painful. And sometimes those pains, quite honestly, are self-inflicted, right? Sometimes we hurt because we do dumb stuff. But sometimes pain comes along simply because we live in a fallen world. And this world is full of evil. Not because it's the way God designed things to be, but it's because of the way our sin has made things to be. But no matter what the cause of our pain all of us at some point are going to feel broken. Maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually, maybe all of the above. And regardless of the cause of our brokenness, we need to remember and be thankful that Jesus Christ allowed himself to be broken so that we can have hope. Out of his brokenness comes Because of the brokenness of Christ, we are blessed. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind today as we continuing our journey through the book of John. Turn with me, if you will, to the seventh chapter of John. And we're only going to read one verse in chapter seven, then move on to chapter eight. But we're, we've been studying the book of John, and for the last several weeks, we've been in what's called the festival cycle, right? And each of the stories that we have told, each of the encounters that Jesus has had have centered around a different festival, an Old Testament festival that the, the, Jew, the Jews have been celebrating, the Israelites have been celebrating. And, and, and today's passage is a little bit of a departure from that, in that it's not really built around a festival, but let me tell you what it does, in my opinion, is it's a beautiful explanation of of a lot of the things that people have been feeling, the people who have heard Christ teach, the people who have heard him preach, the people who have been moved by his message, either moved towards hope or some have been angered by his message, right? And equally moved, but they've been moved towards brokenness, all right? But the festivals haven't been the only commonality. Again, another commonality that we've had is between Jesus and his, the reaction that the people have had to Jesus' teachings, all right, especially the Jewish leadership. They've been working very hard to discredit Jesus, haven't they? Just in chapter 7, they tried to discredit him by saying he, was ne he had never studied back in 715. In 720, they said he had a demon. In, in 727, they said he was born in the wrong place to the, me, the Messiah. They were looking at every single possible way that they can discredit this guy because he is turning everything upside down. His teachings are different. His teachings have authority. His teachings are outside the norm of what they're used to. And, and I got to tell you, they repeatedly tried to arrest him. And this won't change, will it? Throughout all of Jesus' earthly ministry, one of the constants we have is the Jewish leadership 
trying to arrest and do harm to the ministry of Jesus Christ and eventually to Jesus Christ himself. And I thank God that they were successful because without the cross, I know exactly where we'd be. And it's no place I ever want to go again because it's totally bereft of hope. There's also, though, been a a lot of doubt among the people who have heard him. Again, the Jewish leadership, I wouldn't say they were entirely successful in discrediting Jesus, but they weren't entirely unsuccessful either, were they? They've created a lot of doubt. I mean, some think that this might be the long-awaited Messiah. Some whisper among themselves that there's no way he's the Messiah. He must be from Satan. All right? The majority, though, I think we're somewhere in between those two ends. But one, one common thing that we see throughout the people is they're not really being outspoken for Jesus Christ. They're murmuring to one another because... They might believe this guy, but they don't want to upset the Jewish leadership. They don't want to upset their religious leadership. If you will, they were really interested in what this guy had to say, but they were also very proud of their position of religiosity. Because that's what the Jewish leaders taught. Religiosity. What in the world is a word like that, Nash? Is that really a word? Yes, I looked it up. I didn't think it was, but it is a real word in the dictionary. And religiosity basically means going through the motions of religious observance. What do you mean, Nash? Is there anything wrong with going through the motions of religious observance? Not inherently, no. But if that's all you're doing, you're not doing it right. Let me rephrase that because at points in my life, I have been a dedicated religiosity observer. If, we're not do- if that's all we're doing, we're not doing it right. Is it important for us to gather here on Sunday mornings for church? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons we're trying and working so hard to make sure the Word of God gets proclaimed here on Facebook, because there's some folks that still don't feel comfortable getting out and about. There's some folks that live a long way away from this place, but over the last 14 months of, of Facebook Live and things like this, they feel like they're a part of our family, and that's a wonderful thing, okay? And we want to continue this, but let me tell you, if all you're doing is sitting here to check something off the list, you're doing it wrong. Because we need to be here, but we need to be here in order to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Because when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, a true personal encounter with Jesus, it changes everything. And i got to tell you, that's exactly what today's story is all about. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible, I think. Okay? So let's read together. John chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 53, going through chapter 8, verse 11. So each one went to his house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. When the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center, teacher, they said to him, this woman has been caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your name and in your presence. And Father, I just pray that this time that we spend together today will be so much more than just an exercise in religiosity. Help us, Lord, to earnestly seek you, to seek your face, to seek your presence. 
I pray, Father, that something that is said, something that is sung, something that is heard from your spirit directly will change us. So the person who leaves here is different from the person who came in because we will be more like you. And Father, I just pray you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Now, I've got to be honest with you. Sexual immorality has been around just as long as there have been more than three people, right? Sexual immorality is just one of those things that has been a part of the human race ever since sin entered into the equation. So, really, the, the, the fact of the woman being caught in adultery isn't the major point that we're going to focus on here, okay? And I was reading today in a Pew Research study. Pew Research is kind of a, 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 a like Barna. They, they, do st- they do studies, and they ask church folks questions. And there were some alarming statistics in that study that I read yesterday. It said over 43% of all People who claim to be committed Christians find no problem with sex outside of marriage in a committed relationship. i got to tell you, I have a problem with that. You know why I have a problem with that? Because this has a problem with that. All right, i got to tell you, sexual immorality is any kind of sexual, anything of a sexual nature between two people who are not in a biblical marriage. That's a man and a woman, period. All right? The reality is anything outside of that is wrong. And by the way, anything outside of that is equally wrong. I remember when I was growing up and the AIDS epidemic was really, uh, really getting a lot of publicity, getting a lot of press, getting a lot of just people were talking about it. They said, that's it, homosexuality is going to destroy the family. I'm like, nah, heterosexual sex outside of marriage has done too good of a job of that for them to ever touch it. And the reality is, though, one's no worse than the other. And we as a church need to come to terms with that. Okay? We as individuals as well as we as a church need to come to terms with that. Wrong is wrong. Not, not, just, not because we say it's wrong, not because the grown-ups say it's wrong, but because the Word of God says it's wrong. So there's no question this woman is guilty. No question whatsoever. She is guilty. So there's no question sexual immorality is wrong. There's no question that this woman is guilty. So I think the real question that Jesus is trying to address here is how should we handle, as a church as well as individuals, this situation? That's what Jesus really shows us, okay? Our our passage opens up with a real contrast. You see, Jesus and everybody else do something different at the end of the festival of tabernacles that we've been talking about the last two weeks, right? Right? Verse 53 says, so each of them went to his own house. So they went home. It had been a long day at this festival. The Jewish authorities had been working hard. The the people had been celebrating hard. Everybody was tired. So what did they do at the end of the day? They went home. Is that normal? Sure. Absolutely, it's normal. Is it okay to be tired? Yes. Did they earn some rest? Absolutely. What about Jesus? Was he tired? Did he earn any time, rest time? Has he worked hard enough to earn some rest? And I will agree he went home, but not in the way we think of home. Because verse 1 says he went where? To the Mount of Olives. Traditionally, what did Jesus do at the Mount of Olives? Pray. That's what I mean when I say he went home. Because he phoned home. Folks, prayer is the most valuable commodity we have. It's the most valuable weapon that we have. And we need to be constantly in prayer with our Heavenly Father. And when I say constantly, when when Paul said to pray without ceasing, that doesn't mean walking around with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, we'll run into things. But the reality of it is we need to be in constant communication, constant communion with God through the Holy Spirit. That's what it's like to be in prayer always. And that's what Jesus went off to the Mount of Olives. He went off to the Mount of Olives to prepare himself for the next day, as well as to energize himself and refuel himself from the day before. So i got to be honest with you, folks. Anytime you do anything for God, if you don't start in prayer, you're planning for failure. Prayer has to be the foundation of everything that we do. So Jesus goes off, and he is in prayer. And then early the next morning, Jesus went to the temple complex, and all the people came to him to hear the word of God proclaimed. 
Again, this is the very next day. For, for them, it was Sunday. For us, let's think of that as being Monday. Now, I know tomorrow's a holiday. The church office is closed, so it'll be a little different than most Mondays. But most Mondays, you know how many people come in here to worship God? I'm in my office. Debbie's in her office. Sandra comes by to help count the offering. That's usually about it. Michael might be out here playing in the bushes and pulling some weeds, but doing the work of the Lord. But how many of us gather together to hear the word of God proclaimed on Monday morning? Well, I just did that yesterday. You know what? We should gather with the word of God every single day. I'm not saying we're going to be having church services every day unless that's what God tells us to do, then we're going to do it. But we need to spend time in this book every single day. Only if we want to grow in our relationship with Christ. Jesus was magnetic. Everywhere he went, everywhere he taught, everywhere he spoke, he drew a crowd. All right, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be magnetic by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not claiming to teach with authority like Jesus did by any stretch of the imagination. I just try to get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit speak. But let me ask you a question. Societally speaking today, when the Word of God is proclaimed, does that draw a big crowd? I want you to think back to yourself. Think about an Easter service compared to the crowd at the Super Bowl which is more important to our society. As a society, we got our priorities a little mixed up sometimes, don't we? Oh, but Nash, it's different. There's only one Super Bowl, and there's a whole bunch of different churches. Really. I agree. And I agree, more people attend church on the average Sunday than attend the Super Bowl at one time. That's true. But if you also count the people at home watching, I'm not so sure it's as lopsided as we might think. Oh, but that's just once a year, Nash. I mean, church is every week. That's a big commitment. I kind of think he made a big commitment to us too, didn't he? The Word of God has got to be important to us. And that's got to be the focus when we gather together. Yes, we're going to say things to honor folks who died for this country. We're going to honor our graduates. We're going to honor mothers on Mother's Day. We're going to honor our dads on Father's Day. But the Word of God is central to everything that we do, or we're practicing religiosity. That's not what I'm interested in, and I hope and pray that's not what you're interested in either. So early the next morning, Jesus draws yet another crowd to himself, and, and, and it was common in those days for the teachers of the law, the teachers, the religious leaders to also act as judges. So if anybody was caught doing something wrong, where do they take them? They take them to the judges so the judge can judge their case. So it's really quite natural for them to bring this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. But I got to be honest with you. I'm not sure that's exactly what was going on. In the hearts and the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes here, the Word of God tells us quite clearly, what, what, why were they doing this? Were they doing this for justice? Were they doing this because the law had been broken? No, they were doing this in order to catch Jesus in a trap. Leviticus 20, verse 10 says, If a man commits adultery with a married woman, if he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. So they were following God's law, right? Well, there's one thing missing. Takes two. Where's he? If they were really after justice, there would be two people brought before Jesus Christ here, right? But there was only one. Why is that? Some commentators have taken a step to say that because it was a setup. They convinced a fella to go to a lady who is known to have some loose morals and say, let's go. But since the guy was kind of on their payroll, they didn't want him to get punished for it. So they just brought the woman. And after all, who are they really chasing after anyway? It's not this lady, it's Jesus. Boy, chasing after Jesus, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Except when you're doing it wrong. And it was really a pretty good trap too because they know Jesus has this has a soft spot in his heart for the weak, 
and for the guilty, right? I mean, he eats with tax collectors. Goodness gracious. This guy will befriend anybody. And they know if they bring this woman before him and, and, and Jesus shows her compassion, then the people will say, he's breaking the law of Moses. We can't follow this guy anymore. But if he comes and he follows the law of Moses and he picks up a stone and said, fine, let's follow the law, then guess what? He's breaking Roman law because nobody under Roman law is allowed to pronounce a sentence of death except the Romans. And i got to be honest with you, Roman society and our society had a whole lot in common And if the Jewish officials brought this lady before the Roman judges and said, here's what we caught her in, we want to kill her for it, and they're like, no, she hadn't done anything wrong. So that permission would not have been granted. And so they really are doing a great job of here setting Jesus up. And I can can see these these Pharisees and these scribes coming together with little grins on their faces, right? Because I think we got him this time, guys. We got him. And they're probably looking around for these things to participate. People in the crowd are probably looking around for these things, saying, man, we got a show coming. I want to be a part of it, too. Seems barbaric, doesn't it? That was the world back then. And before we get too far down the road of claiming we're so much better than they are, we're a pretty barbaric society, too. And here we have Jesus in front of a group of men who simply are trying to twist the law for their own purposes. What's he going to do? I want to, I want to, before we answer that question, I want to get a clear mental image of what's going on here. All right. You know, if you were the producer of the movie, how would you shoot the scene? We got to remember, this isn't like, Hey Jesus, we need to talk to you back here in this little conference room back here so we can have a private. No, this is in front of a large crowd of people. This woman was caught in the act of adultery in the midst of it. So it's not too far to assume that her state of dress or her state of undress is probably not exactly fit for public viewing, especially in the temple complex. There she sits on the ground, embarrassed, humiliated, her reputation in tatters, and her body might be be in tatters soon as well. She is terrified, not scared, terrified. She knows she's done wrong. But the reality is she also knows what's coming next. And she knows this might be her last few moments on earth. All surrounded by a group of men who have no care or concern for her at all. And then there's Jesus. Standing there. Heart and eyes full of compassion. What's she to think? Think about the terror that she is experiencing. Jesus looks at all the parties involved and notice several things. First, the scribes and the Pharisees, again, who should be focused on the law, aren't. They're standing there with grins on their faces, and, and again, Jesus knows there's somebody missing. Second, Jesus sees this woman cowering on the ground, right? Her embarrassment, her humiliation, her fear, they're all there. And in this charged atmosphere with this large crowd quieting down to see what comes next, what does Jesus do? He simply stoops down and begins writing on the ground. Oh man, I want to know what he was writing. We don't know. It's almost dismissive of the charges that have been brought, isn't it? And he's writing on the ground. Some commentators say he's down there listing the sins of those who are bringing charges. Especially in light of the passage that Randy read for us earlier, that excerpt from the Sermon on the Mount that says, you know, adultery and lust is about more than what you physically do. It's about what's going on here. And anytime you look at somebody else with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Guess what, folks? That makes us all guilty. At some point in life, all of us have been guilty. Maybe he was writing lists of names of people that they had looked upon that way. Again, we don't know exactly what he was writing. And we don't know exactly how everybody reacted right away. I think there was probably some gasps of surprise. Those who have picked up rocks and were really trying to make sure they had a good one saw another thing coming. But I think the most telling thing about all of this, 
We know the scribes and the Pharisees left. But the most telling part of that to me completely is the ones that left first. Do you notice that? Who are the ones who left first? The older ones. The ones who had a little more experience in life. The ones who had seen a little bit more. Hopefully the ones who were a little wiser. All of a sudden, what was going on here wasn't exactly what they were looking for. Because as Jesus writes in the dirt, he then stands up and he turns to them and says, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he just stoops down and starts writing again. Don't you know those guys were like, hmm, I didn't see that one coming. This is not what I thought would happen at all. This group of self-righteous men suddenly found themselves on the same ground in the same position of the woman that they brought before Jesus. You see, they brought her before Jesus so that Jesus would judge her. Yet Jesus judged them. Why are you doing what you're doing? If you are without sin, then by all means, start throwing stones. Well, the crowd might have thought the next sound would be the sound of a stone hitting flesh. That's not what they heard, is it? What did they hear? They dropped their stones. Why? Because not a one of them was without sin. And you know what? Not a one of us is either. I've told you this many times. I will tell you many more. There are only two types of people in this world. Dirty, rotten sinners and dirty, rotten sinners saved by the grace of God. All of us are dirty, rotten sinners deserving of death, damnation, and eternal life in hell. Except for the cross. That paid the debt that we could never, ever, ever pay. And as these men turned and walked away after dropping their stones on the ground, realizing that Jesus has done it to them again. Do you think that filled Jesus' heart with joy, that he had won the day? No. Because you know what they're also taking with them? Their sin. They're turning their back on hope, taking their sin with them. Yes, they dropped their stones, but did they drop their load of care and concern? No. Matter of fact, I think when Jesus looked up and saw only the woman before him, I think he was heartbroken. Now, was it only the woman? No, because they're still in the center, is how the Holman translated it. They're still in the middle of this crowd. Did some dissipate? I'm sure they did. Those who were most looking forward to this event probably felt the guiltiest. And the crowd did dissipate to some extent, but he looked up and he locks eyes with this woman. And he asks a simple question. Did he ask this question in order to get information? No. Not at all. He asks the simple question. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Think about how the last few minutes have affected her. Is she still humiliated? Yes. Is her reputation probably still in tatters? Probably, but honestly, it probably wasn't great to start with. She's in front of a crowd of people. Now, granted, Jerusalem was a big town. It wasn't a little town. It was a pretty big place, but you know what? Even in a big town, people know the people they like to gossip about, don't they? Don't you think this woman was the kind of woman people would talk about? We like to talk about people who are worse off than we are. makes us feel better. Shame on us. But that's what generally happens. I know some people in that crowd knew exactly who she was and she finally getting what she deserves. Those things aren't what she's thinking about. She is zeroed in on her Savior. She is zeroed in on her judge and realizing her judge is not the enemy. Jesus looks down at her and says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? 
And in that small, probably emotional, tear-stained voice, she says, no one, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn you. A lot of people think the story ends there. Because they see this story as being a story simply about Jesus really, he, he's really just compassionate. He, he forgives every sin, so we don't really need to worry about what we need to do because Jesus is soft on crime, okay? He's going to forgive you no matter what. I've got to tell you, his forgiveness is that big. His pool of grace is that large. Our access to it is that full. But sin's still a big deal. Our behavior still matters. Okay? He says, neither do I condemn you. But then he instructs, go and from now on, do not sin any more. I got to tell you, folks, these two little inter exchanges between Jesus and between this woman, these three exchanges, he says something, she says something, he says something back, show us how we're to handle those that we encounter who are engaged in sinful activity. And i got to be honest with you, when I read this passage and I look at how I behave myself, sometimes I'm ashamed. Because what do we tend to do? I mean, again, we've already established sexual sin and sexual immorality is a big, big deal. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.18 says the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. But the question we need to ask ourselves both as a church as well as individuals and honestly as well as a full society is how are we to respond to people who are involved in sexual sin? Whatever kind, heterosexual sin outside of marriage, homosexual relationships, whatever it is, how are we to respond? As a church, I think the favored phrase is, get thee behind me, Satan. That is not how Jesus handled this situation, is it? Because you know what that is? That's picking up a stone and that's using it, at least in a threatening manner. I'd never throw it at anybody. Yeah, but you'd point it at them. You'll threaten And if you let your emotions rule too much, one day you will throw it. Verbally, if not physically. So how do we respond? It's wrong, Nash. We can't just let it go. You're right. It is wrong. And it's not our job to judge it either. So as a church, as individuals, as a society... Got to drop the stones. Show them grace. Show them the sinful nature of their actions. Pray that the Holy Spirit will come in and do that, that, that transformative work that only the Holy Spirit can do. But when we encounter them, how should we treat them? The same way we should treat everybody else with love. As a capital C church, all Christians, I don't think we do that very well. As an individual, sometimes I don't do that very well. And I'm pretty sure all of us can say that too. At some point, we've all not dropped the stone, but dropped the ball. So we need to, we need to find that, that, that thin line between, I don't want to condone what you're doing, but neither am I going to condemn you. But Nash, you're asking an awful lot. You're right. I can't stand up here and tell you what that looks like in every situation, but I can tell you this. If you listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient, he'll guide you. And that's what it's all about, folks. We need to be looking for opportunities to show the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We need to look at other people's sinful natures, and we cannot condone what they do because what they do is against the Word of God. But nor can we condemn them. Because I don't care how guilty you are. Are you ever so far from the cross that he can't save you? Great Christian song says he'll never let us fall further than our knees. Because we're all that close. To make that one declaration. 
to follow Christ Jesus that changes everything. But instead, as a society and as individuals, we tend to want to make one sinful behavior worse than another. I've got to tell you, the foot of the cross is level. We can't look at that one and say, ooh, that one's real bad, but that one's only kind of bad. I don't care if you steal a Cadillac or a candy bar. A thief is a thief. And as far as sexual immorality goes, it's the same thing. It's either a yes or a no. There is no gray area in between. We need to do better, folks. The reality is, when Jesus looks back down at this woman in care and love and compassion, She expects the final word to be guilty. But instead, the final word is grace. The final word is hope. And I just thank God that he has said the same word to me. To all of us. You know, there was once a lady by the name of Charlotte Elliott. Now, Charlotte was kind of a sickly woman. Matter of fact, she was sick all the time. She used that illness and that sickness as kind of an excuse, if you will, to never do anything for the Lord. Now, her brother was a preacher, and and she lived with her brother, and her brother was constantly inviting her, come to church, or come to this event, or come to, you know, I'm sick, I'm an, you know I'm an invalid, I can't do that. Sometime in the 1830s, her brother said, I'm going to invite her one more time, and then I'm done. They were trying to raise funds for a a, a school for women. And in the midst of this, this, this desire to raise these funds, she said, will you please just come on out to this event? Will you please come on out and and do something? Do something for the kingdom of God. And she said, no, I can't. I'm an invalid. So his brother, her brother kind of shrugged and hung his head and went out the door. And as she was sitting there that night, the Holy Spirit got a hold of her. He said, you know what? I think my illness, my brokenness has become the most important thing in my life. That's really a terrible place to be. Because I want God to be the most important thing in my life, not my brokenness. And she felt a move of God in her soul, a move of God in her spirit, and she sat down at her table. She picked up a pen, she picked up a piece of paper, and she wrote these words. Just as I am, without one plea. Recognize that? Go ahead and put the first verse up for the invitation hymn, sir, if you don't mind. Because it was in in that brokenness, in that despair, in that really just wanting to do nothing more than serve God, were these words penned. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And this is an example of a woman who didn't allow her brokenness to define her. Because instead of guilt, instead of brokenness, she found the love of God. And she found the grace of her Savior. Because sometimes, you know who the one wielding the rock is? It's us. You know who we're wielding it against? Ourselves. And that is just as wrong. But when we realize that brokenness is but a step towards wholeness in Christ Jesus, then we can drop those stones too and be forever linked with our Heavenly Father. The challenge for us this week is really quite simple. Drop the stones. When we face the world, a sinful world, a world that is in such desperate need of the light of God, let's not show them the darkness of stones. Let's love everyone that we encounter, even if they're not very lovable, because guess what? Neither are we all the time. And let's reach out to them in obedience to God, praying that the Holy Spirit will get a hold of them, because that changes everything. Just a moment, we're going to sing this wonderful hymn of invitation. And I want you to know this message is for all of us. God takes us just as we are in our brokenness, in our sinfulness.
and shapes us to be useful tools for him and his kingdom. If that's not an act of grace, I don't know what is. And that's the God we serve, folks. A mighty and a wonderful God. Not a God of stones, but a God of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings that you give us every single day. Father, I just pray that you will help us. Help us to be agents of your love and grace. Help us, help us to deliver your grace and your love to this dark, dark world that needs it so much. There are enough stones being thrown, Father. We don't need to throw any more. Instead, we need to focus our hearts and our minds' attention fully and wholly on you and to be obedient to you in everything that we do. And help us, Lord. Help us to walk that fine line between not condoning the sin but not condemning the sinner. Because the reality is all of us are sinners in need of your grace. I pray, Lord, that during this time of invitation that you will speak. I thank you, Father, for taking us just as we are, but loving us too much to leave us there. Help us, Lord, to change and be more like you. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray.